What an amazing group of uh, people to be joining. It's like a swingers party for data sexuals. <laughs> I'll let you sit with that. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, my life and what led me to being the world's most connected person in the world. Uh, I've got some visuals, hopefully, that are going to uh, let us see those uh, behind me. But ultimately, I, my story is more about what I learned and what it was meaning, what it meant to be connected to so many different things. As you can tell, I've spent a lot of time in the news recently. I'm not someone who's used to being in the news or on television or in magazines. My family liked it, but for me it was terrifying because this privacy we all worried about suddenly was very real for me. And I learned it wasn't about privacy, it was about security. I've been called a lot of things. The BBC, The Guardian, other organizations have called me the world's most connected human, which is better than a year ago when I was the world's most surveilled person. Just recently in Times Square, someone was listening to me speak, and he t texted his daughter, and his daughter said, oh my god, you know Chris Dancy? He's like a robot from the future. And I thought, wow, if a, if a college person thinks you're like a robot from the future, you might be doing something right. At least they'll treat you well when you're old. But for me, it was really about deciding in 2008 what it would be like to never go offline, what it would be like to constantly be in the internet and to be the internet. Being the internet is a lot of work <laughs> because you got to understand a bunch of things about your life. Some of them are related to your health. Some of them are related to uh, your identity because so much of what we do is online with our social networks. Some of it's related to just the nuances you don't even consider. Every time you swipe a credit card, you're, t you're talking to the internet. For me, sorry, can we go back a couple slides because we're not syncing here, guys. Thanks. Perfect, one more. This is what you get for hanging out upstairs with the AV guys. They get to mess with you. For me, it was about working with my physician. My doctor, his name uh, is Dr. I'll just say Dr. Will, he knew a lot about me, but he wasn't ever spending any time with me, and I thought this was kind of telling. Uh, Dr. Alfred would come in, spend a, a few seconds with me, and then leave. So I started making notes every time I saw him. And when I'd go back in, I'd look up and say, hey, you know, a few months ago I was chatting with you and you said this, or two years ago you said this. He goes, how do you know that? And I'm like, you've got charts. I'm just looking at my phone and the notes I took. By 2010, I was going on to WebMD and searching for all the diseases I was developing in real time. Um, I, I'm one of those people that look up the side effects of the medication as I'm taking it so I can develop them in real time. <laughs> I have palpitations just speaking to the pharmacist. Um, and then in 2011, I took all of my medical records and I had them scanned and sent them to Mechanical Turk and had them typed out, had all my lab results for 20 years put in spreadsheets. Bring a pivot chart to your doctor and he'll fire you. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> It's unfortunate, but it's real. Um, and then, you know, Google has this great thing called flu trends. I also got into things like uh, uh, the Worried Well. So the Worried Well is this community that literally spends all their time online talking about the things they might end up with. Um, it's better than Real Housewives of Atlanta. Um, and they share the symptoms they're developing and, and what their friends think. And then you find other crowdsource sites. And then you've got all these people now wearing uh, wearable technology, which is even more enticing. Because wearable technology allows you to put all these things on your body and for them forget about your body. So just like your phone lets you put everyone you've ever known in your phone and then forget they existed and your address and how to drive, wearables let you put everything on your body and forget about your body. You know, and, and that's really profound the way that we've outsourced our ability to be aware of our bodies uh, to these wearable devices. And if you notice that the newer Walgreens look a lot like a Genius Bar, um, there's more hardware and software and in in lab tests and, and doctors and, and, and technology in a Walgreens than there are in an Apple store. So healthcare is completely online. And, and probably most importantly, the one thing I wanted to understand was fundamentally at a genetic level, was there something I could change about my own life by understanding my own information? So I next had to go and study my identity. How many of you remember I Dream of Jeannie? I'm 47 and I look damn good. Um, <laughs> But I Dream of Jeannie, she hated going to her bottle. 
But once she got in there, she was completely comfortable. And if you think about it, our mobile devices are a lot like Jeannie's bottle. We know we shouldn't look, but ugh, just get in there. And then we're like, oh, I'm in my bottle. It's you know, Major Nelson. It's OK. I'll be out in an hour. Um, but what is it about our devices and our identity that is so linked uh, together? So I went through and I looked at all the different systems, hundreds and hundreds of systems, and mapped them from my devices to the information they gave me about myself and learned this is impossible to find who I am. I then started taking photos and seeing how much information I could compress in a single photo without doing a lot of work. So in 2011, I took my first Instagram photo that had a bunch of information laid in it, the weather, the songs I was listening to. But you can see last month in Vienna, I was compressing a lot of information. It's like the atomic weight of that one photo is really heavy, but people loved it. It's because they could get everything in one small size bite. It's basically a photo tweet. Um, but one of the most profound things I took away from putting myself completely online was perspective. You know, Nintendo said it best, everything not saved will be lost. And <laughs> when you went to pull out that cartridge. Uh, this is a Japanese tsunami stone. They built it over 600 years ago. But they built on top of it because there hadn't been tsunamis in 600 years. So we don't need the information anymore. And well, they got a tsunami and found the stone and said, we should have saved this. You see, some things when it comes to being digital require long-term thinking. The oldest cave writings are 30,000 years old, stone tablets 2,000 years old, books, papyrus 2,500 years old. We only have 1% of that, but that's a remarkable amount of information. Because if you think about the technology we're using today, floppies, if you can find a floppy drive, only last about 15 years, and the average web page is changed every 100 days. 100 days that information has changed. So the information we're creating digitally isn't lasting. And if you think about the services we're using, as they get acquired, we talked about some of the acquisitions earlier, they get more and more expensive. But the interesting thing is the information gets more and more temporary. If you can create a service whose information actually dissolves in front of you, you will make billions of dollars, right? Because we only care about what we can't keep. A lot of my friends are posting photos online, and then they're posting their activity. Literally, they are having to prove they exist because there's no record of it past that moment. In some ways, we're dissolving right in front of our own eyes. We're the first time in human history we're creating information that won't last, even if you want it to. I'm not the world's most connected person. I'm the world's most documented. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means understanding that if you're going to find anything important about your life, you might want to start thinking about how you live it digitally, because you don't want to end up like the Ark of the Covenant. Ultimately, it's privilege. I spent $10,000 last year on devices to adorn myself with. I spent $20,000 putting things all over my home so I could keep track of everything in it. But the amazing thing about this $30,000 it wasn't for the devices. It was for the premium services to buy me back. You can own a Fitbit. That's in 100 bucks. But the data service for the premium is $100 more. So every time you buy a little trinket from Apple, remember there's tens of thousands of dollars worth of information they'll sell back to you in the future. So how did I do this? Well, I designed my life to fall into three categories. Soft data, anything I can construct about myself. Yeah, I'm doing great. Look at this picture of me in some fancy location. Hard data, my heart's beating really fast. I didn't sleep well. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. Can't lie about some of those things. Sensors will know. This room is cold in certain areas. It's really bright right here. It's really loud probably over there. And then core data, genetics. I then took that information and created a low friction data collection routine to take 10 areas of my life, everything from health, entertainment, anything I listen to, all the music they've been playing and it's getting recorded on my phone, um, and pump all that information into a system seamlessly in the background. I then used a Google Calendar to show me my life in real time so I can Google my life at any point, flat files, spreadsheets, and deep learning engine from Stanford to understand where the information was going and what it could possibly mean. And I learned some really important things about my life. The first thing is something that Douglas Rushkoff said. He said, when the only value left in life is uh, time, everything becomes a clock. Well, your life is really full of information. And you're actually really blessed, but you just can't see it. 
You can't see all the things you're involved with. You can document the hell out of them, but you'll never see them. So if you could see it, what could you learn? But it's not just in documentation. Because if you notice, we're losing time. On a lot of social media, they have Throwback Friday or Flashback Thursday, you know, all these memes. If we're forgetting the day, the week, and the year, we have a bigger problem than inf dissolving information. The new iPhone takes a photo, but it's got three different ways to change the time on the photo. You can speed it up, slow it down, or make a video or a panorama. What is it with time? Why are we so obsessed with this? E-cigarettes are amazing if you're a smoker, but they don't end. If you want e-cigarettes to be a hit, make them last seven minutes. People don't smoke for nicotine, they smoke for time. We're living in the relentless now. Do you ever feel like you can't keep up? Always busy, hurts so much. You just want to stop. People say, do you ever take a digital detoxification? If you have enough money to go to an island without internet, you've got too much money, not too much information. <laughs> so this information is interesting because it can be seen in two different ways. People turn it into something ugly and people turn it into something kind. For me, I often thought, oh, I'm not sleeping well. There must be something wrong with me. But as soon as I had enough information, I understood it's not me. I'm waking up when there's noise in the room. I'm waking up when there's light in the room. I wasn't broken, the world was. And I needed to see that, I needed to understand that, even my driving habits. And this feedback doesn't have to be judgmental or negative. For me, it was very, very profound and positive. I lost 120 pounds. So what I did was I took three years worth of information and I said days that are over 3,500 calories have these people, place, things, music, behavior, and days that are under 3,300 calories have these people, places, things, behaviors. So I was only looking for 200 calories different. Now, make my house act like those days that are 200 calories different. Make the lights, the temperature, send me messages, hide email from people. <laughs> Literally, remove everything and guide me toward a world that adapts to make me a better me. That's what, why your information is worth so much money. Because it's yours. It can make you better. But this, this, this is a very, very dangerous knowledge because people, they're not machines, but in every situation we're given a choice, they will behave like machines. And you've seen this. You know, some of you might remember Tom Hanks, You've Got Mail. You know, that was a great relationship about two people who met online over email. Uh, and then we've got, you know, you know, maybe a decade or so later, Joaquin Phoenix and her, and that was a relationship that met in his ear and then talked to him and he fell in love with her. And, she was having a polyamorous relationship with everyone else. Sorry to ruin it for you. But if you think about relationships on our devices and online today, the latest iPhone will tell you everything. If you text someone, there's seven different ways to send them information about you or avoid them. That's not communicating, that's hiding. Why do we need seven ways to talk to someone in a text message if we weren't worried about not talking to someone? And I love some of these. Any moment that I don't have a notification on Twitter or Facebook is a failure. Someone tweeted that, I thought, I've gotta save that. There was little dots, there was a thing in the New York Times about people having this apnea, they are just to stop breathing, waiting for someone to text message as little dots, right? This guy wanted to join Ello, but he can't because he considers himself a brand. Uh, and machines, have you ever been in the grocery store and you're scanning groceries and someone comes up behind you and you try not to make an error because you don't wanna be judged by them? Or worse yet, you don't want that person who's manning all six machines to come over and judge you. Or held up your phone to take a selfie and just contorted your body. Or, or you're someplace where you can't get a signal and you suddenly become Lion King. Right? If you're contorting your body for a machine, the robot takeover you fear happened in the past. I love this one, it's my absolute favorite. The card reader at the gas pump won't read my cards and so now I must go inside and pay like a poor person. <laughs> I don't know why we call it automation. We should just call it what it is, human avoidance systems. And why do we want to avoid humans? It's real simple. Grocery score scanners, ATMs, gas pumps, they're consistently average. Humans, inconsistently delightful. Consistently average beats inconsistently delightful every time because it acts like the internet. This guy on Tinder for a profile photo just has his bank balance. 
I mean, if you're going to be information, own it, right? So we said this was a data sexual conference. This guy, seven-year-old Paul's in the middle of a sentence thinking what to say. Hold on, Dad, he's buffering. <laughs> Takeaway here, you, you become what you bend into. If you bend into it, you become it. It's a really simple paradigm in life. And then finally, the unaided mind is overrated. How many of you have been in a car where three people have a GPS running simultaneously so they can weaponize the directions? <laughs> That's not driver. I mean, you want to, if you want to get rid of distracted driving, get rid of cars. I mean, there's nothing you can do anymore. So perspective is really the power that we're going to get from all this information. A lot of these apps will start to give you some level of perspective. Some of my favorites are Time Hop. Um, you know, activity trackers. People love these activity trackers and wristbands, but in essence, they're just showing people who they are. It's the first app that showed them themselves. Uh, I love Tiny Buddha. It sends me text messages throughout the day that, says, that say nice things. It's like I'd rather tiny, have Tiny Buddha contact me than have any friends, because it says slow down. But the takeaway here is that resilience is really the act of perpetual perspection. So what could you do with your information that have it fed back to you constantly or be available so you felt kind and calm? The implications of this are pretty groundbreaking. Right now, most people are focusing on social, mobile, analytical, and cloud. To me, I'm focusing on sensors, environment, algorithms, and mesh. If it can't operate outside the internet, like my body stays online even if my phones go offline, right? So I'm an inner net, right? Advertisers can't get to me. People can't get to me. Don't think dark, ugly things. You would do it if you could. Algorithms help you understand information, get them to you more uh, effectively. And of course, sensors answer all the questions that you think is about things that are wrong with you, that there's nothing wrong with you. And it's not a phone that takes pictures. It's a camera that makes calls. And what's about to happen with Apple and Google is going to change a lot of things. They both announced platforms for our home and our bodies. Everyone who updated to uh, the new iOS has HealthKit on their phone, tracking all of their behavior. Google has Google Fit. So what does it mean now that we've moved computers onto our bodies into our homes? You know, as the website for this event has this line on it, it says, everyone will have a personal algorithm in the future, right? And I thought, oh, gosh, someone's really thinking. Because in reality, what we're talking about is not Big Brother, but Big Mother. Because with the right information, it's not surveillance. It's kind, and it's yours, and it's always available. You should be your own Wikipedia, but you're not. Then last week, Jawbone pushed this update. When you're sleeping now, it'll automatically adjust the temperature so you sleep better. It'll talk to your thermostat. You just became the interface for the house. But it's going to get creepier, I think. I'm not real sure how people are going to deal with this, but when they announced the iPhone, they said there's three things we're announcing today. A uh, touchscreen iPod, a revolutionary new phone, and an amazing new way to browse the internet. And we know they weren't three products, it was one. And when they announced the watch, he said it's a fitness tracker, it's an intimate new way to communicate. You can actually send your heartbeat to someone you love. Say, hey, do you feel me? Can you imagine someone, you haven't sent me your heartbeat in, in an hour. Sorry, we've been cuddling. <laughs> I couldn't, I thought you could feel it. Send it to me now. Yes, it's really funny. Within five years, no one's going to be buying apps. They're going to be buying habits and environments. It's real simple. Everything I'm talking about is literally in the past, and everything that's going to happen is already somebody's already working on a billion dollar company to do it. See, it's not about the Internet of Things, it's about the personification of things. We want to see the Internet in everything, and we want to be the Internet everywhere we go. We don't want to connect to it, we want to bring it here. I'll end with just this final thought. It's really important to me. But we need to stop solving our human problems with technology, and we need to start solving our technology problems with our humanity. Thank you.